Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Unscripted Faith. We are so glad you have invited us into your living room or wherever you're at. I'm Jay Anthony Gilbert alongside Angela Madden. So good to be with you as well. Good to be with you, Pastor Jay. I yeah, love yeah, yeah. this. You know, today we have an opportunity to talk about how life is so much better when God is in the center. Come you know, on, somebody. I, I think we need to learn a little bit about, so. uh, you know, getting over ourselves and getting yeah. into God's word. And so Jimmy and Kelly, we've got a question for you. Which one of you needs to get over yourself? <laughs> uh, <laughs> both? Yeah, I think we're not allowed to say neither of us. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all in on that right there. Yeah. What about getting over God's word? I figure one of y'all need to own one of them at one point or another. Somebody needed to get into God's word. Somebody uh, yeah, need to get over the themselves. only hope I got is God's word because, uh, yeah, that, the, you're right on, man. Uh, us getting over ourselves, mm -hmm. that, I mean, that really is how life makes sense. It's how life works best. Yeah, so I'm right there with you. No doubt. Well, listen, we're so glad to have you guys, and uh, we want to get right in on it. And uh, one of the things we love here on Unscripted Faith is to hear about your story and your testimony. Uh, and both of you came to Christ in a very unique but different way. Uh, and yeah. can you share with us a little bit, uh, let's start with Kelly, and uh, share with yeah. us your journey to find Jesus Christ. Oh, man. Well, I was the classic good church kid. So went to church, did all the Sunday school stuff, answered all the questions the right way, had my Bible highlighted up. And yet uh, there wasn't really a depth of faith there. And I didn't realize that until one day when I was probably in junior high, I opened my Bible in my bedroom. Why? What was I reading? I don't remember. But on my own, I pulled out God's word. And I just will never forget that moment of reading something that God just leapt out of the page at me. And it was this moment where I remember thinking, this is a real God. <laughs> this yeah. God is alive. I can know him. I can have a relationship with him. And I just grew a hunger for him through his word, even as this awkward junior high kid. But there'd been a lot of Pharisee-like tendencies that have been cultivated in me as a firstborn, as a good kid, a straight-A student. And so, so much of my faith journey after that has been unlearning those Pharisee ways. I sometimes call myself a recovering Pharisee, but like that spiritual pride, man, was deeply rooted in me. And Jesus has been undoing that slowly since those early days. And that's a painful journey because spiritual pride can like fly under the radar for a lot of us and yeah. come off real noble and godly. But it is, it's an ugly thing in the heart, you know? So you went from a place of relationship to really finding Jesus. Now, Jimmy, you ain't got yeah. that same story. Not so much. You got a whole <laughs> not, different journey. Not but so thank much. God we made it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we uh, yeah, so very different. I, yeah. I grew up in a, a healthy family, but we, we just, uh, we were not a Christian home. And so I didn't really know anything about the gospel uh, and uh, man, I was running with all kinds of the wrong crowd, got involved in uh, stuff I shouldn't have. You know, a big part of my story that um, uh, I, I like talking about now because it's helpful for other folks is just pornography addiction was a big part of my story from the age of 10 to essentially wow. 20. I was like a deeply addicted pornography addict and uh, it was kind of ruining my life and I, I didn't even kind of know it at the time. And then kind of... it inserted in the middle of there was a friend of mine uh, in high school who had the courage to kind of expose me to the gospel and, and tell me uh, what the cross really meant. It, but I really thought it was just like a necklace and a tattoo. I didn't, you know, I just didn't have any sense of it. But then when I realized what he came to do, what Jesus came to do, it just changed everything for me. And so a lot of my journey has been coming out of like the, the totally hedonistic, just giving over to all my impulses. You know, I, I, I dealt with all kinds of things. I was uh, obese for many years. Just gluttony was a big part of my story. And uh, and watching God um, kind of bring me out of so many of like those indulgent appetite, I just want to feed my flesh sort of uh, sins uh, into learning to enjoy him above all things. That's kind of been my story. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, this is unscripted faith. So I have to ask you, at 10 years old, being introduced yeah. to pornography, knowing yeah. what you've gone through, what would you do? What safeguards wow. would you Great put question. around a 10 year old yeah. or, you know, coming up now? Yeah. Great question. Well, you know, I wish that, um, I, I, I always felt very alone in it. You know, as a young kid, um, 
I didn't have like conversation partners who were speaking uh, speaking truth into me. So I think community was a huge mm-hmm. part of uh, my recovery was being able to be known in my struggle and be be able to be pointed to the truth of God's word. Um, m- most of the folks I ran with were enabling me in the process. And, and I wasn't vocal about it, obviously, with my family at that time. I had a lot of shame. It wasn't till I got around a community of people in a church context in high school that um, I felt like, oh, I can actually say I have this as a struggle and I'm not judged by you. I'm actually loved and encouraged and, and held accountable by you. That was a major turning point for me. People in my life, bringing, bringing that sin into the light with other people was the game changer. Wow. Right. Well, you know, I think we that's kind of like- assumed. Oh, go ahead. Go I was ahead, say, we kind of assumed our kids are going to get exposed to pornography, but that conversation piece, that yeah. connection with people being able and, and have a safe way for a kid to talk to someone is actually the most important thing. And so we're trying to bring it up to our kids a lot and just assume that's going to happen. Here's what you do when it does happen. You come talk to us about it and we have a conversation about it. And that's one of the best safeguards we're finding for our own kids. No doubt. Well, as a matter home. of fact, that was going to be my next question because you guys have five kids, the number of grace. <laughs> That's yeah, right. yeah. Hallelujah. Repopulating the earth. Quiverful <laughs> yeah. and running over. But, uh, you know, right. I think that's something very important because such an apropos conversation. My kids are, I have two boys, 10 and 9. They're coming into those years. They're inundated with technology. Everything is about an iPad, an iPhone, all those types of things. Is there any other wisdom? You talked about conversation, but is there any other wisdom you guys would give? Uh, first of all, let us know the ages of your children, but any wisdom that you guys would have to help navigate that? So then, you know, you mentioned it, 10 started being exposed to it. So the devil starts early. What can we do and what are you guys doing besides the conversation to safeguard your kids from falling into that before it's too late? Yeah. Yeah. Well, our kids are right now 13 down to two. So we've got quite a spread of ages, but we have assumed first pornography exposure is likely going to happen before they're 10 with our modern technology. And I think one thing that we're doing is going, we cannot trust physical safeguards to protect our kids. Because ultimately, when they're adults and when they're older, all that stuff is coming. And so the best safeguard we can put is one that's inside the child. And so when we think about what we're doing to protect them, it's like the cultivation of faith is actually a huge part of that, to be teaching them about who God is, that he's actually, he loves the person who comes to him in their brokenness and, and is exposing themselves and saying, I need help. That's actually something honored in the kingdom. Like we're doing these faith, discipleship things, all of that is putting things in our kids that does help them in the moment that they're exposed to something like pornography. But then every year before school starts, we actually have a moment together as a family where we sit down in the living room with our kids that are old enough, you know, the the nine-year-old on up, and go, uh, let's talk about what happens when you look over your friend's shoulder and they have their phone out and they're scrolling something and you see something. We talk about what pornography is. You probably This is probably going to happen in your life, so they're even prepared for it. We name it, and we do role play about, like, what do you do? You walk away, you tell a teacher, and then before you go to sleep that night, you have to tell mom or dad. You have to pull us aside and say, hey, can I tell you what happened today? And I got to tell you, there's already been a couple instances right. with our kids uh, where this has gone down, just like uh, the, the role play we do. And it worked. Like mm-hmm. our kids came to us that, that night and they're like, I saw this thing. And, and now we're having a good, meaningful conversation. But I never had that growing up. And wow. I think that really is mm-hmm. uh, going to be a game changer long term. Yeah. Wow. That is so powerful. Simple conversation full of God's grace and his goodness can transform yeah. lives from a two year old up to, you know, yeah. any age, really. If there were one, if there was one piece of advice that you would give to parents before we go into the next bit, what would that piece of advice be? Um, You know, I think parents are, I've met a lot of them uh, who are just nervous about broaching the topic. It feel, it can feel, and rightly so on some level, um, gosh, it's so inappropriate to expose them to even these themes, like this thing is coming for you. Can't, I can't we keep them innocent for a real long time. And I get that impulse uh, as a dad. At the same time, that's not the world we live in. I think the Mm -hmm. average age statistically of exposure is around eight or nine years old to pornography. Mm -hmm. Um, I I remember just growing up for me, it was the conversation in fourth, fifth grade with my friends and me. So I know that those um, thoughts, ideas, images are coming at a really young age. And so I think that one of the best things you can do is be the first person, not the last person 
that's having uh, conversations with your kids right. about these topics. We, I think parents wait too long, to be quite honest right. with you. And being available. I mean, we're talking about the importance of conversation and a safe space for that to happen. If we're busy, like from sun up to sundown, and our kids get home from school and I'm meeting on the phone and making dinner and all this, there's no calm moment of we're going to all sit outside and play or go for a walk. Our kids actually don't have the opportunity to tell us what's burdening them. And so that very simple thing of guarding our margin, guarding those like little moments of time, that's when our kids are talking to us. Yeah. That's when they're pulling us aside. And then on our busy days, sometimes they're realizing we have one moment where they had to confess something to us and it had to be the next day. And they said, well, mom, you were busy all day. And I'm like, you're right. I was. And it's like, I have to watch that and make sure there's space for our kids to come to us with what's going on. That is such a good word to protect our margins, to make sure there's actual space to have the hard conversations or the ones where they want to confess. That is beautiful. Well, we are excited and we are loving this conversation with Jimmy and Kelly. And stay with us because when we come back, they're going to help us understand how do we get over ourselves. We'll be right back. When you give to Cornerstone Television this month, we'll send you Encouraging Words for a Discouraging World by Dr. Jeremiah. Filled with encouraging and inspiring words, Dr. Jeremiah helps you navigate the difficulties of daily life with faith, courage, and resilience. He shares practical insights and timeless wisdom from the Bible that will help you find hope, comfort, and strength even in the darkest of times. This book includes biblical examples of hope that will inspire you during challenging seasons, inspiring teachings on how to claim victory even in the hardest of times, practical wisdom for holding God's promises in your heart. Whatever hardship you're facing, encouraging words for a discouraging world will help you find perspective, hope, and a renewed sense of purpose. Request your copy today as our thank you gift when you give to CTVN. To give, call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith, and we are here with Jimmy and Kelly Needham, and you know, we're so glad to have you guys, and uh, you guys have two major things that you say all the time about getting over God's Word and the import, or getting into God's Word and getting over yourself. I said it wrong. Uh, yeah, so one of the things... You don't get over God's Word. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But you know, one of the things uh, that is so important, I, I love that, because we live in a day and hour that everything is about ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's all about us. We've turned, in, in my opinion, the gospel is turned into how do I get the American dream into my life? How was your life cultivated to where you came to that conclusion that we need to get into God's word and get over ourselves? Yeah, that's, uh, that's so good. You know, we, we've had so many great voices in our life that have helped shape uh, our view of God and, and what and the very thing you're talking about, Jay. Uh, you know, we, we had a mentor, I had a mentor uh, years ago um, who did this exercise with us. It was so helpful. He gave us the Bible. And he said, okay, here's your job today. Uh, you have to read Genesis 1. And uh, all I want you to do is count how many times the name God is mentioned. Uh, so we read it. And if you've ever done that, uh, it's actually pretty uh, remarkable. I mean, it's like three times a verse for like 20 verses. It's, it's a lot. So we came back and we said, it's a lot of times. And he said, okay, uh, follow-up question. In light of that, who is the Bible about? And, uh, you know, the obvious answer is, oh, I guess it's about God, mm -hmm. which isn't, uh, shouldn't be groundbreaking, but I do think you're right. In our culture, um, when we think about the Bible, the way it's framed is, oh, this is a book about me and how to get my life sorted out. But it's like one of the most helpful things we discovered early on was, oh, actually, this is a book about God and his fame and his worth and his mm -hmm. beauty and we, what we are is a, a supporting character, That's right. not a main character. Mm -hmm. And that was so liberating. It sounds like oppressive and like um, uh, we don't matter, but it's like, well, we matter, but we matter like the moon matters mm -hmm. in that we reflect the thing that actually matters. Right. The sun is what matters and the moon reflects. So that has been really forming, I think, for us over the years. Right. And really liberating because it's a lot of pressure to be the main character of your own life. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you put that on yourself, my life better be really interesting, really cool and really successful if I am the main character. Yeah. But if God is the main character and I'm actually just a supporting character, even in my own narrative, my own story, there's so much 
pressure relieved, so much liberty, so much freedom. And now I can see ways that I can make much of God in my failures and my successes, in my mundane moments and in the ones that are really cool and awesome. So it's actually a really liberating thing to embrace, even though it's very countercultural, even in our Christian subculture world, there's still a lot of we're the main character language out there and God's here to serve us. It's like, no, it's that's reverse that. <laughs> He's the main character. We exist for him. It's actually, Isaiah tells us that, right? That he made us for himself. So we exist for someone other than ourselves. And that's so, we have found that to be so freeing and joy giving. Yeah. So, so yeah. what does that, what exactly does that mean to you on a daily basis? How does that yeah. work out in practice? How does that play out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, um, it's, uh, one of the things it does is it makes a lot of uh, what normally feels tricky or even offensive sometimes in the Bible uh, not as tricky and offensive. I mean, there are certain things that the Bible says, certain claims it makes, cer certain um, uh, statements it makes about um, the consequences of sin and things like that 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 we bristle against uh, in our culture. And it's like, well, if man is the most important thing in the universe, mm -hmm. then I could see why that that thing that you read there would be so offensive to you. But if the worth, the fame, the value of God is the most important thing in the universe, uh, then all of a sudden, so many of the, the passages we stumble over as Christians, as Bible students, uh, really doesn't uh, offend anymore. It actually makes sense. So I just on like a maybe uh, a, a real practical like Bible study level, mm -hmm. it has helped me uh, come to the scriptures and not constantly be like, what is going on? It's like, oh, this if this thing is about him, right. if the world revolves around God, then it actually makes sense that he would respond that way toward uh, sin and mm -hmm. things like that. So that's that's one right. one way I've seen. Yeah, the Bible comes alive. And then I kind of mentioned this earlier, but also our everyday moments, I think, come to life in a fresh way. Because I, I live a very strange life. I'm doing an interview with you guys. That's super cool, right, that we get to do this. And most people would be like, wow, that's such a neat part of your day. But you know what I'm going to do the rest of my day? I'm going to do laundry. And that doesn't feel very cool. <laughs> but you know what God cares about? That I work hard for him, for his glory, right? As though not working for man, but working for God. Like we do all things for his glory. So now I get to go into the mundanity of my day and go, God, this ex my day and my life still exist for you. I still exist for you. How can I do this without grumbling and complaining with gratitude that I have living people in my home who dirty their clothes and I can wash them and thank you for those things. And that I have clothes to wash. What a good, good gift from you. Like all of those moments that are hidden and unseen now matter because of who I'm doing them for. So actually purpose begins to infuse all of my life instead of these small little moments. So even in our work too, we can begin to ask different questions, whatever our jobs are. To go, this job doesn't exist for me and my glory and my benefit and to live this perfect dream life. It exists for God. So how can I go to work? How can I interact with my coworkers? How can I use all things and leverage them for the glory of the one that I live for? It just changes how you think about almost every realm of your life. That's right. Uh, you know, I'd add maybe one other thing to that. You know, for me personally, it, I... Uh, um, I spent a lot of my uh, early life as a touring artist, making music, doing the thing, and it was a very public thing and, and uh, all the cool things that, you know, come along with that. But the pressure uh, was really high to, to be something, to be a somebody, to make it, you know, uh, see the, your name up there and, and to like be interesting and all that stuff. And, you know, it's really, uh, nobody, a uh, pastor told us this a long time ago, no one can handle worship but God. Mm -hmm. And, and when good. we make ourselves the center That's of the universe, good. essentially what we're inviting is like worship. Like yeah. wow. I, I'm the most important. I actually need to be at the top of the totem pole. And you watch this in, in culture all the time, in pop culture, people just burn out. You get to the top of the mountain and you're like, this is exhausting and it's mm -hmm. not good. But if, if instead the fame of God is the most important thing. Now, whether my career explodes and takes off or it kind of stays kind of under the radar and it, and it never makes a big splash, um, I can be content, happy, because I know uh, I'm contributing to, in big ways or in small ways, uh, people seeing the value of God. Uh, it's not about the value of me anymore. And that's just like a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. 
You know, so I want to ask you guys, because you guys got me intrigued here. I'm thinking of something as you guys are discussing this whole matter. Do you think that to be qualified to be a reflector of God's glory, you have to learn to enjoy, to use your words, Kelly, the mundane things of everyday life? Well, <clears throat> there's not one person in the world who doesn't have mundane things in their life. The most amazing people in the world who have the coolest lives still have to take their socks off at the end of the day and find a way to get them clean, right? <laughs> so uh, that's all of us. And I think if we look at what the scriptures has to say about God and how he wants to be honored, he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So even in our Bibles, it's going to the most basic moment of our day, eating lunch. Yeah. What are you gonna eat for lunch today? Do that for me. Don't do it for you. Even So That's I right. think God actually looks at us and says, if life is about me, then I want to own all of it. All of it belongs to me. And that's actually a good gift to us. Like we said, it infuses life with purpose and meaning. But I, I do think you have there's a call to enjoy that because God says, I'm in that. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a part of that with you. And Jimmy, the reason why I asked that question is because the Bible is full of highlights. David brings down Goliath. It's full of highs and lows, but there's nothing in the in-between. And that's why I wanted to ask that question. How important is it to enjoy mm -hmm. the mundane, everyday things that happen? Doing laundry, mm -hmm. going and waxing the car, paying the bills. That's yeah. all part of it. And I think people get lost because they're looking for the highlights that's just living every day for the glory of God. And to that, you say what? Uh, well, I say God is in highlights and lowlights. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he's he's in uh, getting a brand new car and he's in waxing it later. You know, he's right. in, he's he he is in all that. And and Kelly's right. Um, uh, it is interesting when the Bible uh, calls us to honor God. It is not just it at the top of the mountain. You know, it's mm -hmm. in the valleys too, and it's in the the small things. And the I, I remember um, uh, John twenty one. Jesus is talking with Peter and. Uh, he tells him, he, he basically prophesies that, that Peter is uh, one day going to go away and be killed for his faith. You know, he says when you're old, somebody's going to take you where you don't want to go, stretch you out. He's talking about how Peter uh, was going to die one day. And it said he told him this in order to signify by what kind of death mm -hmm. Peter would glorify God. Wow. And that always like, uh, I stumbled over that text for a long time because it's like, Peter's going to die mm. and that's going to bring God glory. Mm -hmm. And Peter even feels weird about this. Cause if you remember in John 21, he looks over and says, Peter looked at the disciple Jesus love and is like, what about that guy? <laughs> like the Bible literally says, what about that guy? And, and Jesus is like, if I keep him around till I return, what is that to you? Right. You follow me. And, and so the Bible's building it. Jesus is building a category for us of, Hey, whether you go on to like, write six books of the Bible and do, and do all these wonderful, and you know, and uh, John did, he stuck around, mm -hmm. got to see Jesus, a vision of Jesus returning. And he wrote revelation and Peter was crucified upside down for his faith. And both of those stories, the Bible says, bring glory to God. Right. I think Christians, Christians need to reckon with that. Like the, the greatest thing you can imagine and the most troubling thing you can imagine in God's economy, if we're doing mm -hmm. that by faith in him, it actually is a way to make him look good to the watching world. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing, empowering statement. Amen. Come on, come on. That is so good. Amen. Jimmy, Kelly, thank you so much for being with us today on Unscripted Faith. Yeah, we're glad to be here. Thank you. And that was so good. But listen, stay with us. When we return, we're going to share a little bit of what we may need to get over in our world. We'll be right back. Welcome to Dashing Dish. Today the weather is perfect for a picnic, so I'm inviting my new friend Terry Squires of Today's Nashville with Cornerstone Network over to my house and we're gonna have some of my favorite picnic dishes with a nutritious twist. Make Cornerstone Network your home for the best in local Christian TV, bringing you programs like... You're going to find freedom. You're going to find healing. You're going to find a clear conscience. You're going to find ways that you're hearing God in the, in the ways you've never heard Him before. You hang in there. He's a God who never, ever lets us go, ever. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. 
Welcome home. I love getting to sit down with Jimmy and Kelly. And you know, Pastor Jay, I think what they hit on is God's the center, not yeah. us. Yeah. We have a lot of things we need to get over. What's something you need to get over? Oh, man. Uh, you know, as we we're talking, I said, like, what are some things? I mean, what don't I need to get over, right. really? At one point right. or another, there's something that God's always picking on, you know. Uh, but I think uh, one of the big things is uh, I have learned everything in my life, even the negative things, I always seek out the mind of Christ. And I say all to say, one area in my marriage, yeah. uh, because there have been many times that God has used me to be the buffer for my wife. And so what will happen is uh, there will be things that I'll be like, man, that girl, mm, she's driving me crazy right now. And I'll be thinking in my mind and God will be like, even if it is, what am I doing in you? Come on. And I, and I, I know I drive her just as crazy as well. Of I mean, course. don't get it, baby, I love you. Uh, you know, I just want you to understand I got to come home tonight, y'all. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, is that, uh, but that's where I had to get over myself because I was yeah. like thinking, she needs to make me happy. Yes. She needs to make it. If you would do this, our marriage would be great. If you would do this, I would. And God's like, I'm leaving that there until you become what I called you to be. Come so on. I'm learning that a lot of times when we go through different things, the question we have to ask ourselves is, God, what are you doing in me? I can't change That's my it. circumstances. I can't change uh, my wife, my kids, my job. I can't change some of these things right now but I can't allow that to change me. And so yes. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I had to learn. A lot yes. of things you know in life, okay, I gotta change that. But sometimes you, you blame your spouse yes. for what God's trying to work out in you. I love that. And I think marriage truly is a great crucible. You know, it is an opportunity yeah. to come. You're in close corners. My husband, he is amazing. And we are wired so differently. But coming into close quarters with that, it is a continual question. Angie, calm down here. Or, or you know, work on this in you. And, and so I love that you you use that illustration of marriage. I do. I think that getting over ourselves is in all things. Yeah. I love the illustration Jimmy and Kelly used from scripture with Peter and John. Yeah. You know, right, right. gosh, we, Jesus says we must die, right? Yeah. We're to carry our own cross. We're to be crucified daily that we have to literally get over ourselves in every given moment with this election coming up. You better be dying yeah. inward, okay? I mean, truly dying yeah. to yourself so that you can carry on and love people as Christ called us to. Yeah. This is the call of Christ. And there's no, you know, no matter who gets in office, the great part is, is that whether this person or that person gets in office, we can still say, God, what are you doing in me? Yes. And what are you doing in the world today? Yes. And as long as we can line up with the mind of Christ, yeah. I think we'll be fine. That's it. To your point. Because it ain't about us. It like ain't Kelly, about us. That's Kelly right. and Jimmy it's all about the glory of God. It is about God and his glory, whether we be crucified upside down with Peter or we are writing the book of Revelation with John. Pre no matter what, we have got to be willing to know it is all God. He is the center of the universe, the center Amen. of the world, and he ought to be the center of your heart. Today, grab a hold of that truth and let him lead you, nothing else. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.